the two foundation stones of this uh, relativity theory. The number one is that time is same for all observers. And number two is the covariance principle, which states that all laws should have same form. I mean, the physics should be the same for all observers. If you are observing universe at Earth, or, or you are observing universe at Mars, you should deduce the same laws that are governing the universe. So that's the ingrained belief that we have. And uh, we saw yesterday that these two things means that if we have two frames, one frame, let's say, is uh, a frame uh, of our illustration. And another frame, let's say this is a train moving with respect to the railway station with velocity v. So what, we, what this principle says that a clock in here and a clock in here should both measure the same time. And they should have the same speed, actually, or a rate. The clock rate in both these frames are the same. Where this frame is a train moving with uniform velocity, a constant velocity. And this is a frame, uh, let's say, railway station. It can be another train moving uh, with a uniform velocity. I'll be talking uh, with respect to trains, actually, uh, because most of the text on relativity, if you see, they have this reference to trains because in 1905, when this theory was being developed, the first thing there was the train. There were aeroplanes in, in, the, in their infancy, but most commonly known thing was the train. The, the most modern uh, texts on relativity, for example, the one by Randy Harris, you'll see there are no much more uh, references to spaceships and these things because we are not familiar with that. But it doesn't matter. The important thing is that we have two frames which are inertial, which means that Newton's first law holds in both of them. And Newton's first law says, if a body is at rest, it's going to be at rest. If, unless acted by a force, or a body in a uniform motion is going to be in a uniform motion. So that law is actually used to define an inertial frame where the second law is applicable. Because second law is not applicable everywhere. It's only applicable in inertial frames. So we have two inertial frames, two trains moving with respect to each other. But for simplicity, we'll take one frame to be a station, the other to be a train. So the one assumption of old or classical mechanics is that the time rate is the same in both of them. And also, these coordinates, which are perpendicular to the direction of motion, they are also the same. Only the coordinates in the direction of motion, they are related by this thing that, for example, a point here on this axis with, let's say, x is equal to three units from the origin here, it seems to be going backward to a person in a train. So let's say I'm in a train, and this computer has x is equal to 3 in your frame. If I'm moving like this, this is going backward. So and since I'm moving with uniform velocity, I can write that this is, let's say, x minus ut. That with time, this coordinate is linearly decreasing. And if I derivate on both sides, with respect to t or t prime, since they are both equal, it doesn't matter. I can derive with respect to t or t prime, it's the same thing. So this is dx prime by dt prime. This gives me u prime as u minus, okay, so there's a bad choice of variable. So let me call it v. So it should have been v because v is the velocity of the train. And u is an arbitrary velocity. So this is a law of addition of velocity. And it says that a velocity in one frame can be uh, measured in another frame, and they would both be different by the magnitude of the relative velocities of the two frames. 
If the train is going by a speed of 40 meters per second, and you are at the train station, and I throw a ball here again in this direction with, uh, let's say, 20 meters per second, the speed that a person at the station will measure would be 60 meters per second, 20 plus 40. And similarly, if a person at the station throws a ball, and I am moving like this, I will uh, detect my own speed from that speed of the ball. So that's what we experience in everyday life. But actually, this law was being challenged around 1900. And the best experiment that was challenging it was by the Michelson-Morley experiment. And the experiment was a very simple experiment of measuring the speed of light on Earth using a simple optical setup, where he was sending optical pulses this way and getting them back, and by superimposing them, he was trying to measure the speed. I'm not going into detail how he was trying to do it. But when he measured the speed of light, of let's say sunlight, which is coming this way, and he can have a source uh, uh, on the Earth itself, but if we measure the speed of sunlight as well, if we measure this way, or for the light coming from this way, he would see that the speed of light is the same. And that was a perplexing thing because this was against the uh, Galilean relativity. What's and actually, this was not the only thing. What people have done. Sir, what was perplexing? Perplexing thing that velocity, the addition of velocities was not holding up because you see, Earth is rotating. Yes. So at this point, this is an observer which is moving towards Sun. So the speed that we should measure should be, let's say, c minus v. And if the observer is going away, the speed measured should be c plus v if Galilean relativity is true. Okay. But it was not that only that. Even before michelson morley experiment, people have tried to measure the speed of light in moving water. So they took a tube of uh, glass, and they have uh, a water which was going into it and water getting out. So, and they were measuring the speed of light through this moving water. And the result was not consistent with this Galilean velocity addition law. And this was then, and people were convinced that something is wrong with this thing. And not only that, Maxwell equations, that when they measured the speed of light in a moving water, let's say water is going this way, and you send light this way, and you measure its speed, and then you uh, put the water in this tube such a way the water goes in the opposite way, and then you measure the speed of light again, the speed of light was not consistent with this formula. And there was third thing, Maxwell equations seem to uh, be saying that speed of light should only depend on the background ether, that people at that moment used to think that ether exists. Since you haven't studied Maxwell equations, I'm not going in detail into that. And recently, we actually have these experiments now, which were not performed in 1905. But we now know that that's true, because in Large Hadron Collider, LHC at CERN, people accelerate charged particles to extremely high speeds. And then these particles decay into different particles. And in addition to new particles, they also produce light. And if you measure the speed of light from, let's say, a particle moving with 99% of the speed of light itself, the speed of light is still the same as if it is emitted by any other thing. Even a stationary candle would emit light that has the same speed. So this was being experimentally established. The speed of light is constant, and it's independent of the direction of motion of the observer. And now we know that it's also independent of the direction of the velocity of the emitter. And Einstein was the first who took this daring step that maybe 
the nature is not what we have been thinking for the last 2,000 years that nature is, that the time is same in all frames. But he assumed that instead of this, he assumed that instead of these two, there are other two postulates, and one of them is the same, that he say, OK, the laws of physics should be same for all observers. But the second founding principle of the nature is that speed of light is constant. C is speed of light, which we know, know roughly is 3 into 10 power 8 uh, meters per second, per, sec per second. Yes, please. Sir, KTSN, what that LHC is? It's a Large Hadron Collider in Europe, where it's, it's a big uh, ring. It's a big uh, circular tunnel where there are large magnets. The particles are accelerated by uh, giving a, a larger and larger potential. And uh, once they attain a particular velocity, they are taken out and we do different experiments with these particles. Yes? Over there, Z prime is equal to Z prime? Yes, Z prime is equal to Z. Sorry, thank you. Yes? So can you explain that in terms of uh, inertial frames, that example ellipse? Uh, this one? OK. So we are standing here outside, and there's a particle which is moving at a speed at, let's say, at a speed of light, which is about 80% of speed of light, or whatever. So we are here in this frame, and then the particle is another inertial frame. It's moving with some velocity. So when light is emitted by that, you measure the velocity while you're standing here. You still see the speed of light is the same as, as the speed of light is by when it is emitted by a stationary source in our frame. For example, you take a candle here. It emits the light, you measure its speed, and then you make this candle move with a very high speed. And then you measure the speed of light again from this candle, and you, you get the same speed. And actually, not only this, people have struggled with this idea for a long time. You look in, in the universe, there's different stars moving with different vel velocities. Let's assume that we don't know about the Big Bang Theory yet, but they're going in different ways. Surprisingly, if you point your telescope at any of those stars and measure the speed of light, it is still the same for all the stars, even though they are moving with different velocities. So that is one step, actually. So this is an experimental thing that was coming up. But a bigger step was the generalization of this idea by Einstein that it's not just something anomalous in one or two experiment which is coming up. He said it's actually the principle of nature that speed of light is constant. It's independent of observer velocity. You are moving and you are measuring the speed of light, it's the same. And it's independent of the speed of the emitter. A stationary emitter emits the light, same speed. A moving emitter emits the light, same speed. And this, as you can see, is against this law of addition of velocity. And that's why it took a long time for people to really accept this thing. But I'll show you that it has, a con it has consequences which uh, seems very different from our everyday experience, but they now have practical uh, implications that uh, almost all of us have this smartphone with GPS in our pocket that relies on, on these things. So just keep these two things in mind. that these are the two uh, principles. I'm sorry, I can't write long sentences because otherwise they'll get shorter and people at the end won't be able to see them. So you, you have to infer the full sentence from a word. So covariance principle is that all laws are the same. And the second is speed of light is constant. And it takes a little bit of time to get used to this. And let's take one example that the consequence of this, and we'll also get to know how to uh, get used, uh, used to with this idea. For example, there is this train, which is, let me put these wheels, it's going this way with the velocity v. And there is a person standing here, let's say 
she's Anna, and she has two light sources. On this side, and on this side. And there is another person standing here on the railway station, who is also looking what is going on in the train. So what happens that at a certain instant of time, a light pulse gets out of it, and a light pulse gets out of it, and starts traveling towards Anna. Now, I'm Anna. I'm moving. And these are the, let's say, two light sources. So the light is coming to me. So I'm moving. But the speed of light for me is still the same, right? The light coming this way and this way has the same speed. This distance is the same. So what should happen? After some time, I should receive these light pulses. But would they come to me at the same time or at a different time? Same time. Why different? Same time, right? The distance is the same. And by the principle of Einstein's special theory, the speed of light is the same. And it is the same in all direction as well. So I'll get the light at the same time. So these are the two events. One is the light coming from this side to, let's say, a particular receptor here, and light coming from this side. So in my frame, in the train, they would both happen at the same time. They are what? They are simultaneous events. Two events. Event one, light coming from this side to this side. Event two, light coming from this side to this side. Both events are simultaneous in the train because they both arrive at the same time. Now let's look from the point of view of this person at the railway station. Would he think that Anna received the light pulses from both sides at the same time? Let's no. see how. No. What's going to happen? He thinks no. that the light started from here. It's going this way. And then light is coming from this way. It's coming this way. And according to this observer, the speed of this light is C and speed of this light is C. But this Anna is moving at a speed V in this direction, right? She is in the train. So when this pulse started from here, suppose Anna was somewhere here. No, the time is passing. The light is coming, coming, coming slowly. So maybe the, this pulse is here and this pulse is here, but Anna has already moved here. Now the light is coming here, and then Anna has already moved here. When she see the signal, but this light is still here. Yes. So this light will reach her after the the light from that side. Yes. So for him, the events are not simultaneous. Yes. Doesn't matter. So this is important. So this, the question is, are the sources of light not in the train? Doesn't matter, because once the light has been emitted, the speed of light is the same for all observers, whether the source was in the train or the source was at the railway station. Maybe these are the two lights at the railway station who just flickered when Anna was here. Right? Yes? If you are in the train, if you are Anna, yes, so, did Why? It's not time travel, it's different conclusion about two events. So the conclusion of this observer is that the two events happen at the same time. And the conclusion of this observer, let's call him Bob. Okay? So the conclusion of Bob is that the events happen at different times. 
for last time. So this is another important question. That speed of light is so fast that the difference would be small. Yes, that's right. That's why why people haven't been able to notice her for thousands of years. Because speed of light is so so fast. And this is actually another very important test. We will do it mathematically, but physically, whenever you are working with special theory of relativity, your conclusions should come down to the Galilean conclusion if you assume speed of light to be infinite. If I assume the speed of light is infinite, this comes here right, right then. So for both of them, it, both the events happen simultaneously. But it's only because the speed of light is finite and is the same for both observers that the events are simultaneous for this one and not simultaneous for this one. So last question, then we'll move to the next one. Yes? OK. So variable simultaneous case. So I'm Anna again. So these are the two sources of light. I am moving, but it doesn't. even if I am moving, I will still see the speed of light to be the same. So they are coming to me with the same speed, so I, they will reach here at the same time. For an observer here, since I am moving, I will catch this light first and that light later, so the events are not simultaneous. Okay. So another very important question, again sources different distance, of course it won't be simultaneous for her and may not be simultaneous for the other one or may be simultaneous. That's not the point. The point is that this thing leads to this thing that simultaneity is a relative concept. That an e two events which are simultaneous in one frame may not be simultaneous in the other frame. And you can generalize this further that if two events are not simultaneous in this one, of course, in general, they are not going to be simultaneous in another frame. Even though there is a law that we will uh, probably not study in this thing that even if two events are not simultaneous in one frame, we can always find a frame in which they are both simultaneous. Okay, so I'll come to this question and this thing back again after one more thing which is actually related to this thing. And this is actually something which is at the heart of special theory of relativity and everything else that will follow. This one simple thing. And that is the time measurements in two frames. If you can get this concept actually, uh, I think you are done with special relativity, even though we'll spend a couple of more lectures on it. Okay, so let's say again, we have Anna here, and she's trying to measure the time interval between two events at this point. So suppose I'm in the train, I have this point, and I want to measure a time interval of this thing. So one way of doing it is that I flash a light and light comes down and I place a mirror here and light goes back up and I have a clock here where that once the light start uh, leaves this flash, flashlight, I push my uh, stopwatch and then it starts counting and once the light comes back I push my stopwatch and measure what the time interval is. So I measure the time interval between two events that take place at the same position in, in this frame. So I let the light go from here downward, light went down, came back up, and when it came back at the same point, I clicked my stopwatch. So I'm measuring the time interval between two events which ha are happening at the same position because the time is different, of course, that's why there's a time interval, but position is the same. So this time, by the way, is called proper time. So proper time is the time between two events that happen at the same position. Because you can measure 
the, the time interval between two events, say that one event is that flash is something happening here, another flash is here. So if you measure time between this event and this event, this is time interval, but this is not proper time interval. So this is very important concept. Proper time is the time interval between two events happening at the same position in a frame. OK, so I'll take questions actually just off of this thing. Let's say she measured time delta t. And since it's a proper time, I will always label proper times with a, a zero under them. So uh, if, if this height is h, what's the time interval? 2h over c, right? So c is speed of light. It went h this way, h this way, so total distance to h by c is the time interval. Now let's see what does Bob see when he sees it from the train station. So here is the Bob, and Bob is looking at Anna. He's not doing anything himself. He's trying to see that how much time Anna should have measured. And this is important to think. He's not measuring his time. He's trying to say how much time Anna has measured. OK, so to him, it look, the experiment looks like this. So this is a flash. So the light went from flash. And it went like this, because the train is moving. And here is the mirror. And then from this, it goes back. And here is the detector, maybe the eye of Anna or some other silicon detector. So to him, if Bob, Bob says that the time, let's say, from here to here is delta t, and I'm not putting a 0, because Bob is measuring time between two events which are happening at different positions in Bob's frame. Because when light left from here to Bob, this point was here. And then when light came back, the point was here. So that's why the two events to Bob has happened at different positions. Right? Could you repeat that? So that's why I'm not labeling it as a proper time. OK. So if the time is delta t, and the, this is moving with velocity v, what would be this distance? This distance would be v delta t by 2. So delta t is time when the train went from here to here. And delta t by half is the time that it went from here to here. So this is the, and the distance is v delta t by 2. This distance is still the h. And what is this distance? This is the distance c delta t naught by 2, right? Because delta t naught is the time that it took for the light to complete the round trip. So half trip is delta t naught by 2. So light is coming with speed c. So this is the distance c delta t naught by 2. G? V is the velocity of train. V is the velocity of the train or the velocity of the Anna's frame. delta t naught uh, because in uh, the speed of light is c, and the time from here to here, because Anna thinks that it took delta t naught by 2 from here to here, so it means this length must be c delta t naught by 2. <laughs> yes, but this is Anna's conclusion. Yes, and but we are relating Bob and Anna together. So Anna thinks that it took time delta t naught by 2 from here to here. So it means, in Bob's view, this should have been the distance. OK. So when the light left this point, the uh, train is moving with speed v. And it took time delta t from here to here, because this is the time recorded by Bob. And now we are trying to relate Bob's time with Anna's time. And Anna is looking at the light, and she says that 
it's the delta t naught by 2 times from here to the mirror. OK? So it means that uh, this distance is c delta t naught by 2 are uh, actually, we can say this that uh, <coughs> I think instead of c delta, this would be c delta t by 2. Yes, you are right. Because if this is the time delta t, this is delta t by 2, so the light came from here to here, so this is delta t by 2, so this is c delta t by 2. So now I look at this triangle and we can see that h squared plus, so this is v squared delta t squared by 4, this should be equal to c squared delta t squared by 2, 4, yes, thank you. And what is h? h is this height which we can find from there, which is uh, c square delta t naught square over 4. No, h to have a same hook. So we'll study that, but that happens along the direction of motion, not in the other way. So v square delta t square 4, c square delta t square over 4, 4, 4 seconds, hello, Jacob. Let's take this delta t on the other side. We get c square delta t naught square. So the other thing is minus v square. Oh, Jacob, I have delta t square. This means it's common area. So c square se divide kar de. So this is one minus v square c square delta t square and let's try to finish it on this board. So we get, by taking square root, delta t naught is 1 minus v square square root. Delta t is square up either layer. So this becomes And to get ye factor of Albert Barbar, I got, let me call it just gamma. This is Greek word. And this is actually a very important result. Now let me explain what it says. So it says that a proper time measured by Anna is related to the time interval measured by Bob by this factor gamma, and gamma is 1 over 1 minus v square over c square. And since v uh, has to be smaller than c for this thing to make sense, otherwise this would be a complex number. So let's say v is uh, some point 1c, that is 10% of speed of light. So this number will always be smaller than 1. This is 1 minus something, so smaller than 1. And 1 over something smaller than 1 is always greater than 1. So gamma is always greater than 1 if there are two frames that are moving with respect to each other. So it means the time measured by, delta, uh, by Bob is always going to be greater than the time measured by Anna. And Anna's time is proper time in this case, and Bob's time is not. So before we get into this thing again, what happens if there, is, there are two events that happen at the same time in Bob's frame, at, train, at the train station he has a clock fixed here, what happens to his time when it is read by Anna? So first of all, by symmetry, the thing should hold both ways. The proper time in Anna's frame is going to be dilated in Bob's frame, that's going to be more. Dilate is a word means more. And the proper time in Bob's frame is going to be dilated in Anna's frame. Because it doesn't matter if the frame is moving this way or that way. Yes? Sir, 
फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल दिस इज आवर रेजोल्यूशन अबाउट नेचर put forth by einstein in 1905 have been tested so far that c is constant in all directions in all frames for all observers and here what we have we have undertook the same assumption and uh, we found that if we do this it means that the time intervals proper time in one frame is going to be dilated in the other frame relative velocity other relative ball Okay, so this is actually uh, another very good question, which is a source of confusion, and which uh, people take some time to get used to, and it has uh, resulted in many uh, controversies. For example, in the light, especially in astronomy, which has been resolved, and this is important to remember: speed of light. is constant and the same for all observer but not its components okay if you see the light beam going in my frame the light is going down and for me the speed of light has only one component which is the vertical component the horizontal component is zero but to bob the speed of light has two component because it has one component this way and one component this way and this component surely is different from that component so components can be different but when you square this one and this one and add them together the the speed of light is the magnitude of the speed of light is always the same and constant so the speed of light of the magnitude is constant but components can be different okay yes uh similar okay so let me come back here so this thing says that two events that are simultaneous in one frame तो पहला जो फ्रेम है उसमें दोनों साइमल्टेनियस इवेंट ये है दैट द लाइट केम फ्रॉम दिस साइड एंड दिस साइड एंड रीच दिस पॉइंट एट द सेम टाइम ओके इन द ट्रेन नो नो बट वो आगे तो लगती है उसको जो स्टेशन पे खड़ा है फॉर मी इन द ट्रेन फॉर गेट व्हेन आई एम इन द ट्रेन आई डोंट केयर इफ समबडी इज स्टैंडिंग एट द रेलवे स्टेशन और नॉट इवन इफ द वर्ल्ड एग्जिस्ट और नॉट एंड एक्चुअली inside the train when the train is moving with constant velocity there is no way for me to tell if the train is moving at all so for me when the light leaves here and here and it's traveling with the same speed and the distances are the same they should reach here at the same time so for somebody in the train the two events are simultaneous but when the same thing is seen by somebody standing outside he would say that i am moving this way so this light is coming but since the speed is finite it is going to take some time so i'm sorry so we will get into these discussions after the class because i have to continue the flow and okay so with this thing uh let me introduce couple of more things and uh, the related to this thing is what happens to the length what happens to the length if measured by an observer which is moving if you have let's say something in your hand let's say some of you comes up he is on the train or railway station he holds a long stick like this in the same direction as the train is moving the the length which is measured by somebody who is stationary with respect to this thing it's called proper length so if i have a meter rod in my hand or anything anything if i can measure its length linearly let's say by counting the number of uh, hands or by counting the number of feet or whatever this is called proper length because it is stationary in my frame the question becomes complicated if a moving observer wants to measure this length because first of all he can take a stick and put it like this because he's moving right so one way to do that is that let's say 
this you are on train <coughs> again let's take this to be anna and there are some uh, and this is being held very close to the train so this is train and the length is held quite next to the train so in one window i have uh, something with with a let's say a torch which emits light and on your uh, uh, on, on your length you mount two mirrors one at the starting end and one at the descent. So I'm going like this. So the light is going up. Once I get it back, I record and I turn on a stopwatch. <laughs> then I keep going, keep going, keep going. The ends come here. The light gets back to me again. I stop. Uh, I stop my stopwatch and I measure the length simply as velocity into time delta t. Right. I, I know my velocity with respect to this person. Remember, there's one thing that both observers agree on. They differ on the time. In, uh, in addition to agreeing on the speed of light, they also agree on each other's velocity, each other's relative velocity. If I say that I'm moving with speed v with respect to the uh, uh, person on the station, the station person also says that I'm moving with respect to speed v with respect to him. Of course, in opposite direction. The train station is being left behind, and for the observer station, the train is going this way. So the speed is the one thing that both observer agree on. So I can measure my length of this rod by this simple thing, that I can measure the time interval that it takes me in going from here to here, and I multiply this velocity with time and I get my length. Now this is a question to you and think before answering. Is the time interval read by Anna in the train proper or improper? Improper. How many of you say that it's proper? A few. And how many of you say it's not proper? More? And I assume the rest of you are still thinking. OK, so let me explain how he measure time, and then you think again. I have this stopwatch in my hand. And the event is the light is going out, 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 out. At one point, when it flashed from a mirror from the first end, I got it back. I turned my stopwatch on. And I keep going. And then the light is going out. And at the same point, it came back. The two event in my frame has happened at the same position. So my, my torch is fixed here. So the event is, the event one was light went out and came back. The event two was light went out and came back. So, but both events in my frame are happening at the same, uh, at the same position. So it means the time interval read by Anna is proper. proper time. So this is proper, it's very important to identify because half of the people, uh, more than half actually get it wrong even at a higher level. I was just actually teaching special relativity to the uh, seniors in the last semester. And uh, I realized later that half of the class, if you give uh, time to convert from one frame to another, half of the class multiplies with gamma, and half of the class divides with gamma. Because people confuse it if the gamma is to be multiplied here or here. And it has to be multiplied with proper time. That's important. And to do that, you have to know what time interval is proper and what is not. And initially, it is confusing. Hopefully, uh, you will uh, get better than uh, those, that class. So this is my length that I have made. And let's try to relate this length to the length measured by Bob standing at the station. So I can do that by relating the time interval. Delta T naught is what? Delta T by gamma, right? I can take this gamma under this and find delta T naught. So this delta T naught is this. And this V delta T is what? So this delta T is the time that is found by this person standing here when the torch passed from here to the torch at this point. So for him, the length is L naught V into delta T. So this V delta T is L naught by gamma. So L is 
L naught by gamma and 1 over gamma is 1 minus V square over C square. G? Because for a person standing at the railway station, the length is when the torch was here, let's say from here, and to the point when the torch was here. So I, I, what I do that I'm also standing here, when I saw torch is here, I start running my stopwatch, and when the torch is here, I stop it, and I compute my time interval. But for me, the time is not proper. Because one event happened here, the other event has happened here. For Bob, right? So that's why for Bob it's delta t. And for Bob, the length is V delta t, L naught by gamma. So this is t. So uh, I'll come back to you. So this is the length measured by a person in the train of something which was in Bob's frame, L naught. So L naught was proper length because it was stationary in Bob's frame. And you see, since this velocity is less than c, this number is less than uh, 1. So this is 1 minus, let's say, 0.1. So this number is always less than 1. So it means length observed by the moving observer is always smaller than the proper length. And I know that this is a little bit of a little bit. But I have already experienced that this is a little bit of a little bit. So let me just give you two phrases that you should never forget. Still, it won't resolve everything, but it will help you uh, remember things. Proper time dilates. And proper length contracts. Because you are going to be confusing that gamma either 1 over lagana hai or either lagana hai. If in each problem, if you can figure out what is proper length and what is proper time, you can always figure out what's going to happen. The other important conclusion from this thing is that length and time are not independent anymore. And by the way, you can check if V is much less than C. Obviously, you know, the other Taylor series is already here. If the Taylor series expand, the zeroth order coefficient is one actually. And to the zeroth order approximation, L is equal to L naught. So classical mechanics or Galilean relativity is nothing but the zeroth order approximation of actual uh, laws of nature. Because when V is smaller than C, the zeroth order approximation of this thing is that you can approximate as one. Similarly, with the uh, with the time time thing. Okay, now let me take a couple of questions. One minus v square. No. So here you see this is one over gamma. So gamma is already one over that. So gamma is one over one minus v square over c square. So one over gamma is simply this. Yes. It's not. So this is actually an important question. What we have done is use special techniques to demonstrate that. Uh, is there any question? So I'll come to back to you. So this is independent of the method, and we'll we'll see that this is this has been seen in the application. Yes. This really less can be of something else. This frame can the जो जिस चीज के आप लेंथ मेजर कर रहे हैं वो स्टेशनरी है वो प्रॉपर लेंथ है और जिस फ्रेम के अंदर आप टाइम इंटरवल दो इवेंट के दरमियान में मेजर करते हैं और वो दोनों इवेंट एक ही जगह पे होते हैं द टाइम इंटरवल इज प्रॉपर इस केस में वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट द सेम थिंग सो द लेंथ वॉज प्रॉपर हेयर एंड टाइम इंटरवल वॉज प्रॉपर हेयर बट दैट्स नॉट ऑलवेज दैट मे नॉट ऑलवेज बी द केस <laughs> okay, so the question is that here we have done something in a moving frame and the observer is stationary. So
So the same thing would happen in the reverse as well. As long as you keep track of this thing. And let me show you a couple of examples where actually you'll be able to understand it much easier. So let's say we have a clock which is made of some pendulum and it's going like this at uh, the railway station. So this is Bob's frame and Anna is moving on a train with velocity V. And let's say her velocity is so high that it is 0.8 times C. If this is one revolution, the time period is 3 seconds. What's the time period of this pendulum measured by Anna who's going in a train past this uh, thing? <laughs> So to do that, let me just uh, compute gamma first, then we can talk. So gamma for this is 1 over 1 minus v square over c square square root. 1 minus one, v is equal to 0.8 c. So this is c cancel with c, so 0.8. 1.67. 1. Square, somebody has computed. 1.67. 1 over 0. 0.6. 1.67. So what's the final answer? 1.67. 3.2? Or maybe something else? 1.67. So let me see, I have written it. 1.67. 1.6, okay. 1.6 is the gamma factor. So is the time measured by here, her is longer or smaller? Smaller. How many of you say smaller? Raise your hand. Okay, you have half a minute to talk to your neighbors to convince you that it's the other way around. Please do. This is a time period, which by definition means that it's a time that between the event one, when this bob left from here, it went there, and after three seconds, came back at the same point in Bob's frame. So for Bob, this is nothing but a proper time. So the proper time has to dilate in all other frames. In all other frames. It doesn't matter. It train ke andar hai, bahar hai, wo dilate ho rega, ye nahi hoga. It has nothing to do like that. So railway station and train are completely equivalent uh, inertial frames. No difference between the two. So you can see that it dilate ho rahe, ya kam ho rahe, wo aapko isse pata chalega, you have to figure out that the time is proper hai ya nahi hai. So this is proper time. So what we have this. This is a formula. So delta T naught into gamma is the delta T in the other frame. So it means that the time measured by Anna should be 1.6 into 3, roughly 4.8 seconds. Okay. Let's take uh, another example, actually a quick one. Let me do it here. Yes, please. Oh, sorry. 
much cheap. So the question is, what's the difference between proper and improper time? So let's get back to that train example. So in the train, okay. So let let me just say we are in in this clock. So I throw this shot and I get back the winner. So it's the throw over the night event. यहाँ पे इसका वापस आना दूसरा इवेंट है। तो दोनों के दरमियान में टाइम जो है, एक टाइम मैंने यहाँ पे मेजर किया, स्टार्ट किया और फिनिश यहाँ पे किया। तो दिस इज़ नॉट अ प्रॉपर टाइम, क्योंकि दोनों इवेंट दो मुख्य जगह पे हुए हैं। देखें ना एक इधर है, एक इधर है। लेकिन अगर आप चौक ऊपर फें Okay, so this is a very important question, and the question is why do times change or why do legs change? Nobody knows the answer to this question. Really, in physics and in science, so this is actually an important question. Several thousands of years ago, people used to answer two types of questions in science and philosophy. The one was always, how does universe behave? The second question was always related, why does it do so? So, but about a hundred years ago, people have stopped answering the second question. The, only, the science and physics is only concerned with finding the fundamental laws that govern the universe. But we, we try to reduce the number of known laws and maybe uh, Sometimes we reduce all those laws to only one basic law, but we don't try to answer why is it so. So speed of light is constant, that we know, but we don't know why it is so. No, it, so it, it's not just trick. You see, it came from this important assumption about universe. And this is the assumption that is underlying all of this. It sort of came from some mathematical trick. They have come from these two things. Yes? So what if the train accelerates? What is? What if the train accelerates? Sorry, I can't hear. People are talking. Sir, what if the train accelerates? Okay, so... So you have one minute to talk to each other and we'll resume. Because I think people... <laughs> You see, there are two types of, uh, in, in this sense actually only one type of particles. All fundamental particles, they decay into other particles after some time. They have their lifetime. So for example, protons, neutrons, they have lifetimes of billions of years. And there are some particles, let's say muons, they have a lifetime of uh, a few microseconds. And similarly, there are some other particles that have lifetime of uh, a few minutes and so on. But people have discovered this peculiar thing which actually support this thing, and that is that, let's say you have this particle, let me call it mu on, it's going with some speed v. And if it is not going with some speed v, if it is stationary, 
this is mu1 and let's say v is 0. Suppose I'm holding mu1 in my hand. If I time the interval between its creation and its decay to other byproducts, it's about 2 microseconds. After 2 microseconds, it's gone. But if this starts moving and I sit on it somehow <laughs> and I still have a stopwatch, okay? So you can say I'm riding the mu1. <laughs> and I have a stopwatch. So once it's created, I click it on. Now the mu1 is going. And after some time, it's decayed. It's gone. What happens to me is something else. <laughs> but if I measure the time, you think it should be different than this two microseconds? No, because it's still the proper time when I'm holding it here. What's it different than if this is moving and I'm still holding it? For a frame in which this mu1 is stationary, the time, its lifetime is going to be the same. It's still 2 microseconds. But for an observer who's standing here, the lifetime would be different than an observer which is sitting here. For an observer which is sitting on top of mu1, it's about 2 microseconds. And is this proper time or not? Yes. Proper time. Good. Now, if this is moving with, let's say, a speed of 0.999c, gamma is about 70. And when you measure speed of its lifetime by standing outside, for example, a particle is created here, it's flying by and you uh, turn on a stopwatch when it's created and measure the time till it's decay. The time is going to be roughly 140 microseconds. And this is done routinely at the Large Hadron Collider again. Particles are produced and their lifetimes are measured very easily because when they flow through the electronics, when they are created, there are signatures left and when they are going, they have a certain track and when they are, let's say they are going like this, here when they are decaying, they turn into several tracks. You know this, you can compute their speed, their mass and you can find how much time did it take. It's the time, lifetime of mu1 for an observer with respect to whom it is moving with this heat. Okay, so the next example, this is a tricky one. This is a question actually to all of you. So we are here in the sun, in the solar system. Let's say this is our Earth. The nearest star that we have is called Proxima Centauri. The distance from here to here is 4.5 light years. And one light, light year is a distance unit. And one light year is a distance covered by light in one year. So it takes light 4.5 years to go from Sun to Proxima Centauri or for the light from Proxima Story to reach us. If you sit on a space shuttle and you are going with a speed of, let me write here, 0.999c. How long will it take you to go from Earth to Proxima Centauri? I don't care about reference frame. Okay, so I think I do care about that. <laughs> so the reference frame is that of a person who is in the ship. The person who is sitting in the ship, the ship is moving with a speed of 0.9999c with respect to, let's say, Earth or Proxima Centauri. How long will it take for the for the ship to go from here to here?
Forward five week light year is a question, uh, it's an answer that you get to if you're still thinking in Newtonian physics. So what happens is this. When you are moving with this speed, the length from here to here is contracted by a factor of 70. So the length is 4.5 divided by 70. Okay, when you are in the ship, you are going very fast. The length from Earth to Proxima Centauri, which is 4.5 light year in this rest frame, in this frame, is not going to be 4.5 light year for a person in this one. It's going to be 4.5 divided by 70. It's L naught by gamma. And if you compute, if you compute delta T naught in this frame, it's going to be 4.5 light years by 70. And you divide this distance by 0.9999c. And you convert this answer into days that I did. It comes out to only 21 days. So, but the interesting thing is this: that you you are in the ship. You are going from here to here in 21 days. You are coming back in another 21 days. Total number of days is 42 days. How long you think? Would the people on Earth think that you have been away? Nine, nine light years. Nine, nine, nine light years. Because you are roughly going, sorry, nine years. Because you are going roughly at the speed of light. <laughs> so the idea of time and length, they are interrelated. <laughs> yes, and that's why we think that. Okay. <laughs> so let me repeat. It. So I know this is a bit complicated, initially. So let me give you to discuss it among yourself. Like one minute. They are both proper times. It depends, okay? Because if I'm standing here and I start my clock, and another person who sits in a spaceship goes away and then comes back and he starts his clock when his frame has attained a certain inertial speed and he continues with that, and then somehow uh, he gets back because I'm neglecting the acceleration deceleration part of returning. So there's a proper time for him, and there's a proper time for me. And once he comes back, he would have only aged 42 days. And his proper time is 42 days. And well, but the time that I have measured by standing at the same point between these two events, him going and coming back, it's, rough, it's going to be nine light years. Because for us, at this speed, this is how long a it should take. And this problem is actually more complicated because in this there is acceleration involved. When we try to figure out everything, it has to go from zero to certain speed and then get back at some point. 
Because 4.5 light year is the distance from here to here, which is proper without frame. And this 70 is gamma. Okay, and so this is the distance that would be seen by the person in spaceship. And this is the speed of light, this is his speed, so this is roughly the, the time that it will take. So this is the length seen by the person in the spaceship. Yes, please. Sir, 9 light years, how much time is the distance? 4.5 and 4.5. 4.5 distance, how much time is the distance? Because the speed is roughly speed of light. Nine years, yeah. Yes? I believe. Okay, so it's almost time. Uh, those who want to go can go and we can uh, discuss the question with the rest.